Screen Directors Playhouse, star Edmund O'Brien, production DOA, director Rudolph Maté. <laughs> This is the Screen Director's Playhouse, one of the weekly features on NBC's all-star festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by the makers of Anison for fast relief from the pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. By RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. And by Chesterfield, always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking, plus no unpleasant aftertaste. And that's the biggest plus in cigarette history. Tonight, the Screen Director's Playhouse is pleased to present for the first time on the air a dramatic study in human conflicts. Our story is D.O.A. And our stars, Edmund O'Brien with Peggy Castle. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here is Edmund O'Brien. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A little personal background about D.O.A., the production we are dramatizing tonight. To me, it possesses one of the finest and most original stories presented on the screen. I can honestly say that I accepted this assignment before I was through reading the script. I hope you will enjoy listening to this hour of intrigue as much as I enjoyed making it. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien. And now, before we present the first act, here's a word from the makers of Anison. If you suffer from the pains of headaches, neuritis, or neuralgia you should discover what many thousands have known for years, that Anison brings you incredibly fast, effective relief. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Probably at some time, you have received an envelope containing Anison tablets from your physician or dentist. Thousands of people have been introduced to Anison this way. Try Anison yourself the next time you suffer from the pains of a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. You'll be delighted at how quickly relief can come. Anison is spelled A-N-A-C-I-N. Your druggist has Anison in handy boxes of 12 and 30 tablets, and economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100 for your medicine cabinet. Ask for Anison today. <laughs> Now the first act of the Screen Director's Playhouse presentation of D.O.A., starring Edmund O'Brien in his original role of Frank Bigelow, with Peggy Castle as Paula. Shattering the unusual midnight quiet of Spring Street in Los Angeles were the footsteps of a lone figure. Fatigued footsteps, climbing the mountain of stairs leading to the police department. As the inevitable green lights cast their rays in the darkness, outlined was the figure of a young man suddenly grown old. His face haggard, worn, unshaven. Then, as if the effort were superhuman, he opened the door of an office marked Homicide. on your mind, bud. I want to see the man in charge. Oh, in here. Captain, I... Well, what can I do for you? I want to report a murder. Sit down. Where was this murder committed? San Francisco. Last night. Who was murdered? I was. that file, O'Banion. I don't have much time, Captain. Do you want to hear me out or don't you? Your name Bigelow, Frank Bigelow? Yeah, how'd you know? O'Banion answered the San Francisco APB, sent a direct to Captain Moss at Homicide. Tell him we have Frank Bigelow. Yes, sir. Hey, 
care for a drink, Bigelow? You look beat. No, no, I haven't the time. Okay. Tell it any way you like. I live in Banning, on the way to Palm Springs. I'm a CPA, certified public accountant. Well, a couple of days ago, I decided I needed a vacation to make up my mind whether or not I'd marry my secretary, Paula, and San Francisco was my selection. Paula and I were having a drink at a bar when I broke the news. I want to go with you, Frank. Now, look, Paula, I'm just going on a little vacation. I told you that. Well, you want to go without me, don't you? I'd only be gone a week. I suppose you just made up your mind to take this little vacation at 9 o'clock this morning. Now, don't be like that, Paula. Don't be like what? You just drop a little announcement that you're going away. Not tomorrow or next week or next month, but today. No explanations, nothing. And I'm supposed to swallow the excuse that you need a little vacation. I just feel that I've got to get away from this town for a few days, that's all. Get away from this town or get away from me? Oh, I wish you'd try to understand, Paula. How can you ask me to understand anything like this? No, I'm sorry, but I don't understand. Go to San Francisco. But don't expect me to be waiting for you when you get back. I'm leaving right now. Paula, please, turn around. Look at me. Why do you hurt me like this, Frank? I don't want to hurt you ever. You know that. Then why don't you be honest with me? As honest as I am with you. Do you have to go? I have to go, Paula. I know what I'm doing. All right, go. Go anywhere you like. You can go to Blazes for all I care. Paula. Yes, I know. I'm being foolish. Come on now. Give us a little kiss, huh? I know what's going on inside of you, Frank. You're just like any other man, only a little more so. You have a feeling of being trapped, hemmed in, and you don't know whether or not you like it. Then surely you can understand why I need this week away, Paula, for your good as well as mine. Yeah. I thought by now we'd be married. I want to be honest with you. I care for you too much not to be honest with you. I'm as concerned about your happiness as much as I am for my own. Even more so. Oh, I know you had one bad experience. Frank, I know all about it. Let's not go through that again. But, Paula, you don't know what it can do to two people. And the woman always seems to get hurt more than the man. I don't want you to get hurt, darling. More than anything else in the world, I don't want you to get hurt. Come on now. Drink up. Sure. You know I'd be lying if I said that I liked it. But I'm convinced deep inside of me that you must go. The hotel in San Francisco was hopping the night I arrived. My door was open, and across the hall, a party was in progress. From where I sat, I caught a glimpse of a beautiful blonde babe doing the rumba and giving me the eye at the same time. Meanwhile, I was returning a rush call from Paula and Banny. Paula? Oh, hello, Frank. How was the trip? Fine, just fine. Having a miserable time, I hope. I can't tell yet. I just got in. What was that? Oh, it's market week. Place is crawling with traveling salesmen. Why the rush call? Oh, oh, yes. Uh, did a Mr. Phillips phone you? Eugene Phillips of Los Angeles. No. Well, he will. Phoned the office three times today. Said he wanted to get in touch with you immediately. To use his exact words, it's most urgent and imperative that he reach you at once. What did he want? Well, I don't know. But he sounded deep, dark, and mysterious. I'm quite agitated about something. Phillips, Phillips, have we ever done any business with him? Not unless you've been keeping it a secret from me. I looked through all the accounts. Well, why did you tell him where to reach me? I'm supposed to be on a vacation. So you told me. And so I told him, dear heart, but the gentleman didn't seem to respect your temperamental moods the way I do. He was very insistent that he speak to you before it's too late, as he put it. Well, you take care of it. Tell him I have changed my plans and you don't know where I can be reached. He won't talk to me. Well, call him back. If it's as important as he says, he'll talk to you. If not, he can just wait until I get home. My, aren't we adamant this evening. All right, shall do. And, Frank... Yeah? I... I don't quite know how to say this. Say what? Well, what I want to say is there's nothing you can do that you ever have to feel guilty about. Sure. Thanks, Paula. I'll call you tomorrow. 
Oh, say, friend, I'm awful sorry to bother you. Will you mind if I use your telephone? Oh, go right ahead. Oh, thanks. Thanks so much. I'm right across the hall. One uh-huh. of the boys used to my phone. Been on it half an hour. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I just want to call downstairs. Oh, that's all right. Go ahead. Uh, room service, please. Nah, things sure pick up last few days, isn't it? You write up much business? No, I'm not here on business. I just... Hello, room service. Has Sam Haskell, room 617. That's all right. Would you send up three more bottles of scotch, huh? Some ice, please. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, you here long, friend? Yes, I just got into town. Oh, sir, one of you join us for a drink, huh? Oh, no, no, thanks. I... I don't want to barge in on your party. Oh, that nonsense is not a party. Just a few of the boys entertaining some buyers. Come on in. Come on. Well. Come on. Well, uh, <laughs> all right, if you're sure I'm not intruding. Certainly. Glad to have you. I know just how it is to be alone in a strange city. Say, that blonde doing the rumba. <laughs> it's my type. Uh, <laughs> sorry, friend. My wife. been Sam's wife, but that isn't the way she behaved after a few drinks. The hotel room became a little too confining, so the party adjourned to a nightclub featuring the fisherman, Crown Prince of Jive. Why I went along, I still don't know. I don't like other men's wives, but Sue didn't believe me, and her husband Sam was stabbing me with looks, so I made for the bar. Stay with it, fisherman! Get it, fisherman! Ah, blow up a stall, man! Yeah, write it out, write it out. Don't bug me, don't bug me. I'm being enlightened. I got eyes, I got eyes. Ooh, really cool. Say, bartender. Yeah, what'll it be? Scotch, short water, no ice. Coming up. Oh, write it, Dad, write it. Ah, nice, quiet place. Yeah, will it hits the pitch in about an hour. They really wash a moldy fig. A what? Moldy fig. Yeah, six bits. Yeah, thanks. Keep the change. Ooh, really? Hey, uh, who's that glamour girl at the end of the bar? Oh, uh, one of the chicks that roosts regular. She's Bob Garn, George. Huh? Oh, you ain't hip. Bob Garn means she's gone for this stuff. You know, just between you and me, I don't get it. But uh, I gotta listen to it. I got eyes! I got eyes! What's the matter with him? He's flipped. He's tipping his topper. Come down, Jack. Don't bug me! Don't bug me, boy! Well, that glamour girl's giving me the eye. She alone? Oh, sure. Real society always comes in alone. Drives a big convertible, wears a mink coat, knows everybody, but she always comes alone. Ah, that's all I wanted to know. Pardon me. I'm sent! Man, I'm sent! I know you sent, brother. Just let me get past. Go, Ben, the fan! I'm getting enlightened, light. Turn on the light! Well. Hello. Dig that fisherman. It's really silk, isn't it? Can I buy you a drink? Oh, sure, thanks. Leo, give me a glass. Ah, I left my blast up at the end of the bar, Leo. Coming up. I've never seen you here before. I've never been here before. Here's your scotch, mister, and a stinger for the lady. Thanks. Well, drink up. Here's a better jive and lots more drive. Hey, Leo, this isn't my drink. Mine is scotch. Oh, sure it is. You saw me pour it. Oh, come on now. Bottoms up. Okay. Ah, this is crummy stuff. Give me a fresh one, Leo. Anything you say. Oh, just feel those vibrations. Mm. Hey, you don't get your kicks out of this, do you? Well, I hate to admit it, but I don't. And why do you stay here? I haven't any place else to go. Oh, I know, baby. You're lonely in a big city. You don't have to go into a routine with me. I like good company, too. Look, look, do me a favor, will you? There's a girl coming over here. I don't want any part of her or her husband. How about going some other place, huh? Let me think about it. Think fast, will you? She's almost here. Why don't you meet me later? All right, where? Well, call me at this number later. It's my next stop. I got a band there that'll really send you. Okay, let me think about it. I ducked out of the club and headed for my hotel room. When I arrived, I found a basket of flowers waiting for me. Attached to it was a note from Paula... I'll keep a light burning in the windows. Sweet dreams. So I tore up the Glamour Girl's number and I went to bed. It's funny how conscience can ruin a good thing. I dreamt that night that Paula and I were married, as happily as any two lovers could be. The world was ours. I vowed then and there that in the morning I was going back home and begged Paula to marry me. But that never happened. 
because I was murdered. And now here's a word from RCA Victor. Now you're assured of top performance year after year from your RCA Victor television receiver. Now you can buy the RCA Victor factory service contract for expert installation and maintenance. And it's practical, reliable. You can depend on it to keep your RCA Victor receiver in perfect shape. And here's why. You get installation with built-in antenna. Expert prompt service by RCA's own technicians. Replacement of any part or tube, including the picture tube, for one full year. Unlimited service for the first 90 days. And then service at $5.95 per call for the balance of the year. So make up your mind to buy RCA Victor Television. And make it a point to see the superb Hillsdale, a magnificent new television console. And buy the RCA Victor factory service contract when you buy the Hillsdale. We continue with the second act of DOA, starring Edmund O'Brien with Peggy Castle. through that night, I tossed fitfully. I couldn't sleep. My body began to ache. Pains began shooting through my head. My stomach felt as if it were on fire. In the morning, I tried to reason with myself that I'd had too many drinks. But that wasn't true. At breakfast, I couldn't stand the sight of food. Then the pain in my stomach returned. Only this time, the muscles contracted, and I could barely move. So I went to see a doctor who examined me and took a set of x-rays. You're not married, are you, Bigelow? That's right. Do you have any family, relatives, anyone in San Francisco? No, no one. I don't know a soul in San Francisco. Well, where is your home? Why all the questions? What's, th- what's this all about? You must steal yourself for a shock, Mr. Bigelow. Well, what is it? What, what are you trying to tell me? The test reveals a luminous toxic matter in your body. What is that exactly? It's a deadly poison that attacks the vital organs. Deadly poison? I have no alternative but to tell you this. Your system has absorbed sufficient toxin to be fatal. What? What are you saying? Now, please understand. This is... This is difficult for me, too, Mr. Bigelow. I can realize what you're undergoing. I wish there was something I could do for you. But unfortunately, I can do nothing. There's nothing anyone can do. This is one of the few poisons of its type for which there is no antidote. Uh, How long do you think I have? You don't have very long, Mr. Bigelow. How long? A day, a week, two weeks at the outside. It's hard to say exactly. It's, It's impossible. I don't believe it. I don't believe a word you've been telling me. You've made a mistake. It could be a mistake. It could be a mistake, couldn't it? Answer me. There's been no mistake, Mr. Bigelow. Do you realize what you're saying? You're telling me that I'm dead. Do you think you can explain away my life in just a few words? I I don't even know who you are. Why should I believe now, you? please try to be calm, Mr. Bigelow. I want to offer every assistance I possibly can. Assistance? Who wants your assistance? Who wants anything from you? I think you're crazy. You're nothing but a fake. That's what you are. A phony. I'm going to see another doctor. Do I have luminous poisoning, Dr. McDonald? Yeah. You've got it all right. Your system has already absorbed it. Are you sure? Are you absolutely certain? Couldn't you be mistaken? Here, I'll show you. Let me put the light out and darken the room. There it is. The toxin is actually luminous in the dark. No, there's no doubt about it, Bigelow. All right. Don't feel very sick. 
My stomach is just a little upset. Maybe, maybe it's not as bad as you think. That's characteristic. With a heavy jolt, you go suddenly in a matter of hours. But if the stuff is taken in a lesser quantity, you'll last a while, and then... And then? Give it to me straight, Doctor. A number of things are involved. The systemic condition of the individual, the amount consumed, exertion... Yes? You won't feel too bad for a while. Then it'll happen suddenly. A day, two days, a week at the most. A day? Two days? There's nothing that can be done now. If it had been caught in time, your stomach could have been washed out. But you've had it in you for some time now. At least 12 hours, haven't you, Bigelow? I don't know. You don't know? Don't you know how you got it? No! And this was no accident. Somebody knew how to handle this stuff. That wax is tasteless and odorless. And from the alcoholic content of your body, you must have gotten it in liquor. I was drinking last night. I'll arrange for your admission to the hospital immediately. Of course, I'll have to notify the police. This is a case for homicide. Homicide? I... I don't think you fully understand, Bigelow. You've been murdered. Bigelow, where are you going? Bigelow, come back. I couldn't wait. In a frenzy, I ran down the hall and into the street. I ran wildly down the street, trying to outrun my tears and the terrible realization that someone hated me enough to murder me. Without direction or destination, I ran blindly through the streets until exhausted and spent, I stopped at a newsstand to gasp. The magazine banners swam at me, mocking, ironic, implacable. Life. Life. I was surrounded by it, but not a part of it. And I knew then that I'd spend the little time left in finding the man who had murdered me. With whom had I had a drink? The glamour girl at the fisherman's? No, I'd torn up her address. No, no, someone had switched my drink while I was talking to her, but who? Who? Sam! Sam, the traveling salesman. But was he jealous enough to kill? I hammered on his door, but he was gone, checked out. Then my own telephone rang. Hello? Please, Mr. Bigelow. My eardrum. Oh. Hello, Paula. Your enthusiasm overwhelms me. Why didn't you phone me? Oh, I'm... I'm sorry, I... I meant to, Paul, I... I've been busy. Hmm. Visiting the museums, no doubt. But what's happening out there that's exciting or different? Nothing, not a thing. I'll bet you wish you'd never gone. But you're too stubborn to admit it. Sure, sure. You know, if you'd like me to come up, I can pack a toothbrush and leave right away. No! Well, you don't have to snap my head off. You could at least make a pretense of missing me. Of course I miss you. But I just don't feel like talking about it right now. I'll call you later, Paula. Don't strain yourself. Don't be angry. You phone me sometime when you feel more like talking. And by the way, I call that Mr. Phillips back. Phillips? Yes, you know, the man who tried to reach you. Well, I'm afraid you'll never know why it was so important that he speak to you. His office said he died yesterday. Died? When? Yesterday. So you won't have to bother your little head about him anymore. You can just go ahead and have fun. Paula, what did he die from? How would I know, Frank? I suppose he died from whatever people usually die from. What are you getting so excited about? You said you didn't even know. Where's his office located? Well, what's the difference? You can't talk to him now. I told you the man's... Paula, will you stop talking so much and give me the man's address? Oh, all right. It's the, uh, the Phillips Importing and Exporting Company, Bradbury Building. That's Los Angeles? Say, this really is a switch. How come you're so interested all of a sudden? If you want to reach me, I'll be in Los Angeles. The Lancashire Hotel. Are you out of your mind? I've got to hurry, Paula. You were Mr. Phillips' secretary, Miss Foster. Did he have a partner, manager, anyone I I could speak to? What is it in regard to? It's an urgent matter. Well, perhaps Mr. Halliday can help you. This way, please. Oh, who's Halliday? He's our controller. Uh, Mr. Bigelow to see you. Oh, come right in. Oh, uh, Mr. Halliday, Mr. Phillips phoned my office yesterday. I've come to find out what it's all about. You know that Mr. Phillips died yesterday? Yes, yes. I don't quite understand. If he phoned you, certainly must have told you what it was all about. He didn't talk to me. I wasn't at my office when he called, and he wouldn't tell my secretary. I'm afraid I can't be of much help, Mr. Bigelow. I've no idea why Mr. Phillips tried to reach you. 
I'm sorry you had to make this trip for nothing. Huh? How did you know I made a trip? I didn't say anything about a trip. I merely said that he called my office. My office could be here in Los Angeles. Uh, Miss Foster. Yes? Didn't you mention something yesterday about Mr. Phillips speaking to Mr. Bigelow in San Francisco? I said that he had phoned Mr. Bigelow's office in Banning, but that Mr. Bigelow was in San Francisco. I'm sorry if you misunderstood me. Do you know why Mr. Phillips called? No, I don't. All right. Thank you, Miss Foster. Now, Mr. Bigelow... You can readily understand that we've been somewhat upset around here. Mr. Phillips' sudden death was quite a shock. Now, if you don't mind. Did Phillips have a family, a wife, anyone who might be able to help me? Now, see here, Bigelow. You can't intrude on people at a time like this just to satisfy some curiosity. This isn't just some curiosity, Halliday. Then I suggest you wait a week or so. I can't wait. I'm afraid you'll have to. Well, I guess I can get my information out of a city directory. You're a pretty aggressive fellow, Bigelow. Are you quite sure that this is as important as you make it appear to be? It's important. Mrs. Phillips lives at the Sunset Arms Apartments. Thank you. I needn't tell you that Mrs. Phillips is under a strain. I suppose you're capable of using a little more tact with her than you've demonstrated with me. Sure. By the way, what was the cause of Phillips' death? Suicide. He leaped from the window of his apartment. Come in, Mr. Bigelow. How'd you know my name? I'm Stanley Phillips, Eugene's brother. Halliday phone, you were coming. This is my sister-in-law, Mrs. Phillips. How do you do? How do you do? I'll uh, try to be as brief as possible, Mrs. Phillips. I'm afraid I can't be of any help to you, Mr. Bigelow. I haven't the slightest idea why my husband wanted to speak to you. I see. Well, I guess Halliday covered about everything. I, Mrs. Phillips, did your husband ever mention anything to you about me? Anything at all? No, I don't recall Eugene ever having mentioned your name. Look, I know that this is none of my business, but it could be of vital importance to me. Why did your husband commit suicide? How dare you? How dare you? You're uh, not exactly the most diplomatic person in the world, are you, Big Love? Let me walk you to the elevator. Were you a friend of my brother's? I never met him. My brother was in a jam. Pretty bad jam. He was arrested two days ago. What? Yes. He sold some iridium to a dealer by the name of Majak. It's a rare metal, very costly. Anyway, the iridium turned out to be stolen. My brother faced a stiff prison term. And have committed suicide for less. Yes, I know. That's how the police felt about it. What puzzles me, though, is this crooked deal. Knowing my brother... You'd hardly say he was the type of man who'd be mixed up in anything like that, would you? I said that I didn't know him. <laughs> That's right, so you did. I forgot. Now, what's it all got to do with you, Biglow? I don't know. Oh, Biglow, let's come clean with each other, huh? Surely you must have some idea, some inkling, why my brother was so desperate to contact you? Not the least idea. That's very odd. If you don't have any idea, then... How could it be of such vital importance to you? You seem to know all the other answers, Phillips. Maybe you know the answer to that one yourself. Now, here's a tip for discriminating smokers. Science discovered it. You can prove it. No unpleasant aftertaste when you smoke Chesterfields, the biggest plus in cigarette history. Science discovered this fact. Of all cigarettes tested, Chesterfield and only Chesterfield leaves no unpleasant aftertaste. You can prove it. Smoke a pack of Chesterfields. They're always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking. And Chesterfield is the cigarette that leaves no unpleasant aftertaste. That's the biggest plus in cigarette history. Science discovered it. You can prove it. Buy Chesterfields today. You are listening to the Screen Director's Playhouse. 
One of the weekly features on NBC's All-Star Festival, brought to you by the makers of Anison for fast relief from the pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. By RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. And by Chesterfield, always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking, plus no unpleasant aftertaste. And that's the biggest plus in cigarette history. The Screen Director's Playhouse presentation of DOA, starring Edmund O'Brien with Peggy Castle, will continue in just a moment after a brief pause for station identification. This is the Screen Director's Playhouse. We continue with the third act of DOA, starring Edmund O'Brien in his original role of Frank Bigelow with Peggy Castle as Paula. Ever imagine yourself in a plane about to crash? Ever feel the cold steel of a gun pressed against your brain? Ever hear a doctor tell you you're going to die? Suddenly, momentarily, a day, two days, a week at the most? Why did it have to happen to me? Why was I murdered? Why was I sitting here in my hotel room, waiting for the sands of time to run out? Hello? Well, Sinbad, i just about given you up for lost. Now, do you mind telling me why you rushed down to Los Angeles? I can't explain how Paula it's much too involved. What's going on, Frank? You don't even sound like yourself. I'm just a little tired, but... I'm glad you called, Paula. I... I miss you. Oh, Frank. I can't tell you how good it is to hear you say that. <laughs> Here I was worrying that I'd lost my charm. When are you coming home, Frank? I'll be home soon. I'll go right out and get a permanent, so I'll be pretty when you see me. Hey, hey, guess what? I found Philip's name in your notarial ledger. Notarial ledger? Uh-huh, of all places. I remember now I made the entry myself. You had notarized the paper one morning before I came to work. What kind of a paper? A bill of sale for a George Reynolds. It was made out to Eugene Phillips of Los Angeles. So you see, I was right. We hadn't done any business with Phillips. Only indirectly. Paula, what was the bill of sale for? A shipment of iridium, whatever that is. Iridium? Did you say iridium? Exactly. You mentioned at the time that this fellow Reynolds had made some kind of deal in Palm Springs the night before, and then he stopped in your office early in the morning on his way north to have it notarized, and... Wait a minute, wait a minute. George Reynolds, that was about six months ago, wasn't it? Yes, that's, that's right. Goodbye, Paul, and thanks. Hey, where are you going? To rent a car and call on a widow. I've got to talk to you, Mrs. Phillips. You please go away. I want to be left alone. Please, I found out why your husband wanted me. It was in connection with a bill of sale. Come in. What do you know about George Reynolds? George Reynolds? Why, that's the man my husband claimed sold him the iridium. And what did Reynolds claim? Well, Reynolds disappeared. About two months ago, my husband grew suspicious that something was wrong. Since then, he tried in every way to locate Reynolds, but he could find no trace of him. I don't him. get it. Mr. Phillips could have proved the legitimacy of the transaction by showing the bill of sale he got from Reynolds. Then there was a bill of sale. That's right. My husband swore there was. But at the time of his arrest, he couldn't find it. It was mysteriously missing. Then if Mr. Phillips did have proof, George Reynolds would have faced the prison term. Eugene was convinced Reynolds had stolen the bill of sale. He was the only one who had reason to eliminate any evidence of the transaction. What do you mean, eliminate any evidence? Well, by the bill of sale, the cancel check. My husband could show no proof of his innocence. Ah. Oh. Thanks, Mrs. Phillips. Thanks a lot. You've been very helpful. A lot more helpful than you were on my first visit. If you'd only come sooner, Mr. Bigelow. My husband might be alive today. Yes, I know. But what puzzles me, Mrs. Phillips, is that you haven't even asked me how I knew there was a bill of sale. Mr. 
Mr. Halliday isn't in, Mr. Bigelow. He should be back shortly. I think you're the one who can help me, Miss Foster. Phillips tried to reach someone else before he called me, didn't he? Why don't you ask Mr. Halliday? Obviously, Halliday wasn't here yesterday. Or he wouldn't have had to learn from, from you that Phillips called me. And you're the logical person to know who else Phillips called. I don't believe that's any of your business, Mr. Bigelow. Don't think you're revealing anything confidential, Miss Foster. I know that he was trying to reach someone else. Mrs. Phillips told me. You're bluffing, Mr. Bigelow. I don't know what you're after, but you're trying to trick me. Mrs. Phillips didn't tell you a thing. How do you know that? Well, Mrs. Phillips knows nothing about it. She doesn't? Why wouldn't she know about it? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I was talking about George Reynolds. Who did you think I meant? Just who is it that Mrs. Phillips doesn't know about? I told you before, it's none of your business. And take your hands off me. All right, I'm going to give it to you straight. The way things add up to me, Phillips was murdered. Murdered? I don't believe you. You're lying. He called me because he needed me to clear him. Phillips was innocent. And innocent men don't have to jump out of windows. I... Just who are you trying to protect, Miss Foster? Why are you so afraid to tell the truth? I'm not protecting anybody. Now listen to me. This thing is going to explode wide open. If you don't have anything to worry about, why don't you talk? Or maybe you are mixed up in it. Oh, no, no. Come on. Mr. Phillips called Marla Rakubian. He went to see her yesterday morning. Who is Marla Rakubian? She's a model. She and Mr. Phillips were once quite friendly. But he hadn't been seeing her for some time. For the last couple of months, he'd been trying to locate her and finally learned where she lived yesterday. When he returned from seeing her, he was terribly upset and excited. That was when he had me put through the calls for you. When he couldn't reach you, we went home. That was the last time that I saw him alive. Give me Marla Rakubian's address. 445 South Weatherly Drive. I don't think that Mr. Phillips realized that I was aware of his friendship with Marla Rakubian. And out of respect to him, I never intended to tell anyone. But I had no idea that she had anything to do with the trouble he was in. I admire your discretion. You must be pretty friendly with Stanley Phillips, Miss Foster. What? At home, didn't I? Stanley knew how desperately his brother tried to reach me, yet he wasn't even here at the time. Now you seem to know all about what happened in Mrs. Phillips' apartment. Miss Rakubian? Yes. Where are you going? Inside. What do you want? Get out of my hotel room or I'll call the police. Go ahead, call them. That's nice luggage, taking a trip. That's right. I'm going away for the weekend. Well, look what's here on the dresser. Steamship tickets. Sailing for Buenos Aires tomorrow. Oh, quite a weekend. Give them to me. I'll send you a postcard. Now get out of here. Who are you going with, George Reynolds? I never heard of him. I suppose you've never heard of Eugene Phillips either. Just who are you? What do you want? Never mind who I am. Where's Reynolds? I told you I don't know him. Now, will you get out of here and leave me alone? What's the matter? Did you forget to pack this picture? Keep your hands off. So, you never heard of him. Don't try to tell me that the face in the picture isn't Reynolds, because that's the man who came to my office. If you think you can scare me, you're crazy. Look, honey, maybe you could get away with that when Phillips came here yesterday looking for Reynolds. But you're in a different spot now, because after he talked to you, Phillips got pushed out of a six-story window. Pushed? Don't act wide-eyed with me. Your playmate Reynolds murdered Phillips, then went up to San Francisco to get me. Because I could have proved that he sold Phillips that iridium. And the suicide would have blown wide open for investigation. And you're mixed up in it right up to your pretty little neck. Let go of me. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not mixed up in anything. I'll decide that. Now let's open your trunk. I don't have a key. I'll break it open if you don't find it in a hurry. All right. I'll get it. Now, throw that picture on the bed and turn around. And keep your hands up. Okay, sister. And don't get any ideas, because I'm not afraid to use this. Where do you keep your wallet? My back pocket. Lie, and I'll blow your head off. Take it out. Yeah. Drop it. Okay. Frank Biglow, Lancashire Hotel. That's what I was looking for. Here's something you're not looking for. <laughs> Sorry if I... Step on your toes. That's better. Now, where's Reynolds? I don't know. Phillips came here yesterday looking for Reynolds, didn't he? Yes. All I could tell him is what I'm telling you. I haven't seen him for months. Hand me that picture. Interesting how mighty careful you are of the picture of a man you haven't seen in months. Kamala, all my love, Ray. 
What's the Ray stand for? It was a pet name. Do you mind? All sounds very cozy, Miss Rakubian. Reynolds steals iridium, sells it to Phillips, then disappears. Phillips is left holding the bag. Without a certain notarized paper, he can't prove his innocence. So the paper conveniently disappears. Phillips made the deal because he wanted to. Yeah. I'll bet you weren't above using what it took to convince him that he wanted it. If I were a man, I'd punch your dirty face in. You know, I think you would at that. The angrier you get, the more beautiful you get. I'll just take this picture with me. Oh, I almost forgot. Here's your ticket, Miss Rakubian. And don't be surprised if I'm at the boat to see you off. From the photographer who took the picture, I learned that George Reynolds was really Raymond Rakubian, Marla's husband. I wanted to talk with her before she left the boat, so I... Hey! Using Marla's gun, I sent a slug through the abandoned warehouse window, driving him back, and I ran across the street. The warehouse was quiet as the death that lurked there. No one was visible. So I inched my way forward and... My heart did nipples. He had dropped the barrel from above. I started up the metal catwalk to the shadowy top. My stomach was paining me and my heart closing my ribs. As I lay on the floor, writhing in pain, I knew that this was it. I was dying. My murderer had left. I had not gotten one glimpse. When I was able to walk, I found a book of matches near the doorway, labeled The Fisher, San Francisco. Whoever had given me luminous poison wasn't satisfied. I wasn't dying fast enough. Finally, I made it back to my hotel room. Gratefully, I opened the door. Oh. Welcome home, Bingler. You're late. Close the door. Uh. Hand over that picture. Marla didn't lose Shut it. Shut up! Uh. And here's another one. Uh. <laughs> Look at you. You can't take it. Soft in the belly. If you hit me again with that gun, I'll kick your face in. Get it. The hotel clerk might know you're in. Hello? Hey. Why'd you hang up on me a while ago? I've been trying to get you for the last two hours. I'm... I'm sorry I was in a hurry. Well, don't be in such a hurry this time. McGowan was in, hollering his head off because you haven't gone over his books. Tell McGowan to get another order. You're drunk. Paula, how much we got in the bank? About $2,500. Draw it out tomorrow. You know that fur coat you always wanted? Buy it. You are drunk. Don't tell me that two days away from me can affect you this way. But it's sure. Paula? Yes? I never should have left you. I just didn't realize how much I was in love with you. But I know it now. Oh, Frank. Frank, darling, I love you too. So very much. Come home, please. I miss you terribly. I said cut it short. Please... Come home soon. That ends the call. Walk in front of me, Bingler, and keep your mouth shut, or I'll blow the back of your skull out. Did you get the picture, Chester? Don't I always get what Mr. Majak sends me after, Marla? Majak? That's right. I'm the dealer who bought the iridium from Phillips. Now I get it. You stole the iridium, you sold it to Phillips, then you bought it from him. His bill of sale disappears, you now legally own the iridium, and he goes up the river. Where do you fit into this, Bigelow? I'm looking for Raymond Rakubian. Oh, you can't expect me to believe that. You forced your way into my business, and I must know why. My only reason is Rakubian. He's murdered me. Stop being cute. Oh! I'd like working you over in the belly. Oh! oh. You asked for it, Chester. You can't do that to Chester. I'm going to blow your guts out, Chester. Uh, uh, 
Uh, look at him. <laughs> He's so scared of Chester. He'll talk now. Leave him alone, Chester. <laughs> He's not scared. You can tell it by his eyes. Keep him away from me, Major. If he comes near me again, he'll have to use that gun. Get out, Chester. Why don't you let Chester work out him, Jack? Get out, both of you. Come here, Bigelow. I want to show you something. Read it. Death certificate. Raymond Rakubi. Yes. He was my nephew. He died five months ago. He couldn't possibly have tried to kill you. Well, I guess that leaves me where I was at the beginning... Nowhere. Was there really an attempt made on your life, Bigelow? This afternoon, somebody tried to get me again. Until now, I had no reason to kill you. Did Phillips demand a notarized bill of sale? Naturally. Why did you have Rakubian get a legitimate notarization? Iridium is a very precious metal. I had to anticipate the possibility of it being traced. With a legitimate bill of sale, the police would have reached a dead end. Because George Reynolds could never have been found. I'm afraid that you've been sidetracked, Bigelow. But you and I have a problem. Now that you know that it's someone else you want, I'm afraid it's too late for you to do anything about it. Unfortunately, you've learned too much about me. Chester, suppose... Suppose I told you I'm not concerned with your part in this, that that I wouldn't reveal what I know. Suppose I proved to you that I only want to find the person who tried to kill me and that I, I won't cause you any trouble. I'm a very practical man, Bigelow. This could cost me my freedom. Chester! Look, me, Jack, please! I'm sorry, Bigelow. I never take chances with my freedom. Chester, take him for a ride. Try to make a boob out of me in front of Majak. Shouldn't have done that, Bingala. I don't like that. <laughs> I'm going to enjoy this. I've done jobs like this before. I knocked off guys I could like, but I don't like you, Bingala. <laughs> you ain't scared yet, are you? But you'll be scared. Good and scared. I think I'll give it to you in the belly. You don't like it in the belly. As Chester kept yeah, giving me yeah, the business, I, I thought the hotel room. something about death. It's like death. getting jelly. Everything Soft, you believe was ugly jelly. suddenly becomes beautiful. We used to have a ride about that. It was jelly. bad enough to die in the glory of a battlefield, <laughs> like to have died in vain, to have been murdered innocently. I only wanted one thing, to breathe long enough to get the person who had stolen my life and my chance came at a signal change. As Chester pressed his foot on the brake, I jammed mine down on his. As his head hit the windshield, I leaped from his car and ran. Paula, what are you doing here? I had to see you. You shouldn't have come, Paula. You shouldn't have. Oh, look at you, Frank. You're a sight. Your clothes look as if you slept in them. Are you ill? No. No, I'm all right. You are ill. You're feverish. I'm, I'm all right, Paula. You're lying. And you're in trouble. Right after I spoke to you, I got a call from the San Francisco police. It was a homicide detective. Well, what is it, Frank? If you're in any kind of trouble, you certainly can trust me. I'm not in any trouble with the police, Paula. I promise you that. But but you can't stay here. You, you've got to go back to Banning right away. No, Frank, I won't go. I won't. I'm staying here with you. Please, Paula, please believe me. It's best that you go back. Why? What's this all about? You're in a jam, aren't you? A bad jam. What have you got to do with this Phillips and Reynolds? Phillips was murdered. What's that got to do with you? All you did was notarize a paper. You've notarized hundreds of papers. <laughs> That's right. All I did was notarize one little paper. One little paper out of hundreds. Oh, you... You frighten me, Frank. You don't even act like yourself. I know you're keeping something from me, that something is terribly wrong, that you're in serious trouble. <laughs> don't be frightened, Paula. Don't ever be frightened of anything. Promise me that. I love you so much, darling. More than you seem to be able to understand. I never really knew happiness until I loved you. Losing you would have meant losing everything. There would have been nothing left. Don't, Paula. 
Please don't. But now, I'm afraid again. I, I feel so helpless. You're leaving me out of something. Tell me, Frank, what is it? Just give me a chance, please. You do love me, don't you, Frank? Yes, Paula. I was uncertain before. Blind to what I had. But I know it now. Do you understand that, Paula? Yes, darling. I understand. Uh, a man can be that way. Something has to happen to him. It, it can be a very little thing or a big thing, but it can make him realize what someone really means to him. Paula, I love you more than I ever thought it possible for me to love anyone. Then why won't you let me help you? Because you can't help me. Because there's nothing you can do. Please go home, Paula, please. All right, Frank. Paula. Yes? Is, is that a new outfit you're wearing? Yes. <laughs> you look wonderful in it. Frank! Goodbye, Paula. Mr. Bigelow, how did you know where I lived? You are listed in the phone book, Miss Foster. Did you see Marla Rakubia? Did you learn anything? Stop playing naive. It won't work anymore. I fell for it once, went off in a wild goose chase. What do you mean? I only told you what you wanted to know. Sure, just enough to sidetrack me so I wouldn't find out that Stanley was the one I wanted. You acted so shocked when I told you that Phillips was murdered. Stanley? Oh, no. Why don't you stop it, Miss Forster? You and Stanley have been together in this thing from the beginning. Now get on that phone. Tell him to get over here in a hurry. What are you going to do? What was Stanley going to do when he used me as a clay pigeon today near the factory? You've been sidetracked, all right, Bigelow. Oh, Stanley. But it was a poor, bereaved little widow who did it. What's wrong with you? My stomach. Why did you try to give it to me? Here, look at this letter. Miss Foster found it this afternoon. It was at my brother's desk in the office. It's postmarked two years ago. It isn't the kind of a letter a married woman gets from a casual friend. And I know my brother wasn't aware that his wife and Holiday were so well acquainted when he hired him. Where did he have dinner? At Mrs. Phillips' apartment. Halliday was there, too. Stanley confronted them with the contents of this letter. Did he have anything to drink? Yes. Why? How long ago? About half an hour ago. Just before I left. Miss Foster, call the emergency hospital. Get an ambulance over here right away. Ambulance? Have them prepare a stomach wash. Tell them it's luminous poison. If you hurry, you may still save his life. found George Reynolds, Mrs. Phillips. He's been dead five months. Then he didn't steal the bill of sale. No, but you could have stolen it. How dare you make such an accusation? It wouldn't be too difficult for a wife to get her husband close enough to a balcony. I must ask you to leave. You knew who I was when I came to see you, didn't you, Mrs. Phillips? But you were surprised to see me alive, weren't you? But I'm not alive. Yes, I can breathe, I can move, I can stand here and talk to you right now. But at any moment it can end. Do you understand, Mrs. Phillips? I look like I'm alive, but I did take the poison. Nothing can save me. What do you want with me? If I I kill you, what do I have to fear now? No, what no, can anyone do to me that hasn't been done already? No, listen to me, you've got to give me a chance. I didn't get a chance. It was Holiday, I swear it. Yes, I took the bill of sale. Holiday planned it so that Eugene would go to jail. I didn't know until today he killed Eugene. Holiday couldn't have gotten away with it. Your husband knew about the two of you. He found a letter. He found it only yesterday. He accused Holiday. They, they, they fought. Holiday pushed him over the balcony. Then why me? Why me? He learned about the phone calls after he killed Eugene. I thought you'd even spoken to you, that you knew enough to involve him. He was shocked to see you still alive, and he followed you and tried to shoot you. He knew he had to finish you before you got him. Where's Halliday now? He's at the office. He's flying out of the country tonight. I don't know where he's going yet. He wants me to join him. Later. Come on with me. No. What are you going to do to me? You're going into this closet. You're not oh. going to warn him this time. I ought to kill you, but I'll leave you for the police instead. <laughs> As I stepped into the street, a jagged pain stabbed me, doubling me over. When I could straighten up, I saw Chester waiting in the shadows. Keep running, Bigelow. <laughs> I'll get you. I won't shoot you in the back. You're going to get it in the belly. <laughs> there was a drugstore just ahead. I rushed into it and prayed. I screamed at fate that had given me the name of my murderer and was now destroying me before my job was done. It takes longer when you get it in the belly. It's nice and slow. 
That's the way I want you to go, Bingler. Nice and slow. Here it comes. Uh! A heavy bottle thrown by a Casper Milk Toast with the courage of a lion and caught Chester square in the head. Once again, I had no time to wait for the police. I had one more date to fill. What are you doing here? Where did you think you were going, Halliday? Get out before I throw you out. You really fright me, Halliday. You're awfully nervous. Let me light your cigarette. Get out! I said I was going to light your cigarette with these matches. Matter of fact, they're yours. I picked them up in an abandoned factory. Look at the cover. The fisherman. Crown Prince of Jive, San Francisco. In a joint like that, who would notice a customer at the bar slipping a little luminous poison into another man's drink? And who there would care except the murdered man? I'll finish the job now, Bigelow. You're tricky, Halliday. Plenty tricky. Now stop sneaking your hand towards that gun in your pocket. Reach in and grab it like a man, because if you don't, I'll shoot you first. <laughs> That's... that's it, Captain. All of it. <laughs> Ironical, isn't it? it? I guess this is the first case you've ever known where a man killed his own murderer. Take a look. Drink this. Thanks, I... Take a look. He, uh, He's dead, Captain. Poor devil. Go the morgue, O'Banion. How shall I make out the report on him? We better make it DOA. Dead on arrival. Thank you, Edmund O'Brien and Peggy Castle, for a most exciting performance. Our stars will return in just a moment. Next week, the Screen Director's Playhouse will bring you a classic in comedy. For the first time on the air, we present Lady Takes a Chance. Our stars, Joan Caulfield and John Lund. And our guest screen director next week is William Sider. Now, here again are tonight's stars, Edmund O'Brien and Peggy Castle. Peggy, Peggy Castle. Yes, Eddie. I thought I'd, I've uh, thought I'd like to get off my chest, Peggy, if you don't mind. Not a bit. Go on. Thanks. I've always felt that a director was the key in the making of a good motion picture. Oh, how right you are. Well, I'm glad you agree, because it's my opinion that Rudy Maté, as the director of DOA, unlocked the pages of the script with complete understanding and brilliance. His artistry of lighting and extraordinary camera angles and his sureness and understanding of movement. Well, Peggy, Rudy Maté is just great. So are you, Eddie O'Brien, and Peggy Castle. I thought your performance tonight was superb. Well, Frank McDonald. Thanks, Frank. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present one of Hollywood's outstanding directors, Mr. Frank McDonald. Thank you. Well, Eddie and Peggy, I'm here to say thanks tonight for Rudy Maté, who is in Europe completing a motion picture. For the screen director's playhouse... I'd like to extend an invitation to both of you to return as often as you can. Good night. Good, Good night. night. Good night, everyone. DOA was presented through the courtesy of Cardinal Productions, and Edmund O'Brien may soon be seen starring in the Paramount production Warpath. Peggy Castle will soon be seen in The Prince Who Was a Thief, a Universal International Technicolor production, co-starring Tony Curtis and Piper Laurie. Piano improvisations on tonight's program are by John... Rary. Screen Director's Playhouse is produced under the supervision of Howard Wiley and directed by Bill Karn. This is Jimmy Wallington speaking and inviting you to listen again next Thursday when Screen Director's Playhouse presents for the first time on the air, Lady Takes a Chance, starring Joan Caulfield and John Lund with Screen Director William Sider. Tomorrow you too can live the life of Riley on NBC. NBC.